This is the Glove 80, and I was a little skeptical about this keyboard at first. There's been a lot of hype around this keyboard, and whenever there's too much hype around something, that tends to make me a little skeptical, but yeah, this is the real deal. Welcome back everyone to my channel that is exclusively focused on software engineering where all we talk about are keyboards. And Mo Ergo was kind enough to send me one of their keyboards, the Glove 80, to take a look at. And to be clear up front, this is more like a first impressions video. It's really hard to do a full on review after having a keyboard like this for such a short period of time. But the more that I use this keyboard, the more that I like it, and there are some things that this keyboard absolutely nails, which I will be explaining throughout this video. But if you're just here for the TLDR, then here it is. If you're combating RSI or repetitive strain injury, or you simply want to prioritize your handheld, then look no further. The Glove 80 is the best ergonomic keyboard on the market right now, hands down. It's not all rainbows and butterflies, and this keyboard definitely is not perfect, but as far as ergonomics go, I genuinely don't think you can get better than this. In full disclosure, this keyboard was sent to me by Mo Ergo for review purposes, but this video is not sponsored, and I'm not getting paid in any way for this, and although I did collaborate with them on making this video, all opinions are my own, and Mo Ergo did not see this video ahead of time. And I'm going to try my best not to make many comparisons with other keyboards, but some comparisons are just simply unavoidable. In particular, the Kinesis Advantage 360 Pro and also the Voyager, and I have absolutely been enjoying this keyboard. Being totally honest, I wasn't entirely ready to give the Voyager a break because I had been enjoying it so much, and this video does come on the heels of my video on this keyboard right here, but due to timing and how everything worked out, the Glove 80 arrived on my doorstep a couple weeks ago. Normally, I'd have tried doing a first impressions video a little sooner, but maybe this will be more like a second impressions video. But I also had surgery on my foot the day the keyboard arrived, and so that kind of put a damp around things. But in order to give the Glove 80 a full treatment, I set the Voyager aside, and I've been using the Glove 80 as my daily driver for about two weeks now. And I know, I know, a lot of you have been asking for a comparison video between the Glove 80 and other keyboards, especially the Voyager and the Kinesis Advantage 360 Pro. I will be doing a full comparison video between the Glove 80, the Kinesis, the Moonlander, and the Voyager, so you know what to do. Hit the subscribe button, and if at any point you find this video helpful or informative, do me a favor and hit the like button. I've essentially been working a part-time job on top of my regular nine to five job and also being a father of three young children. And actually, you know what? I will be dedicating all of the likes of this video to my wife because without her, none of this would be possible. I have no idea how one goes about dedicating video likes to someone. Maybe I'll give her one hug per like because you know, she's definitely not overstimulated by the end of the day from constantly being touched, poked, punched and sat on by your children or, you know, anything like that. Anyway, apologies for that lengthy intro. Let's do a quick overview of the features on this keyboard. And I'll keep this brief, but it's programmable. It's split mechanical, columnar mechanical keyboard with low profile mechanical key switches and palm keycaps, as opposed to PBT, like on the Moonlander or ABS on the Kinesis Advantage 360 Pro. And as you can see, it also has RGB lighting and a tenting mechanism with these legs right here, a removable palm rest, which are screw down there really tight. These are like lug nuts, right? So it also supports Bluetooth pairing with up to four devices and of course a wired connection over USB-C. Okay, so my very first impressions pulling it out of the box and typing on it for the first time. My very, very first thought was, wow, this is light, which is funny because one of my first thoughts when holding the Voyager right here, which is much smaller, was, wow, this thing is heavy. So I weighed them and it turns out the Glove 80 is only slightly heavier than the Voyager. And I feel like this is mentioned in every review video I've watched about how light this thing is, but it still took me by surprise at how light it is. And it also came with a travel case. And yeah, it's 
kind of big. It takes up a lot of space in my backpack. If you wanted to, you could also just wrap the keyboard up in like a, a t-shirt or a sweatshirt or something like that and just toss it in your backpack and it would be totally fine. This keyboard is made out of very tough plastic and it would have no problem surviving in a backpack, but uh, more on the travel case later. So let's talk about the build quality. The keyboard is made out of a blend of PC or polycarbonate and ABS, which results in a plastic that is very tough and scratch resistant. It also has a high heat and impact resistance. And it's why this keyboard can be so light, but also solid and durable. I feel like I've seen a mix of opinions where on one hand, some people say that the build quality is excellent and other people have been less than impressed. And really the only issues that I have with the build quality have to do with the gaps in the seams here on the end of the thumb cluster, which are really just a cosmetic issue and a side effect of the injection molding but this keyboard feels very solid sitting here on my desk and it accomplishes exactly its design goals of being an incredibly ergonomic keyboard. And the design of the Glove 80s Keywell is actually quite intricate and it was a difficult engineering problem to design a mold that would work during the injection process. I'm not going to attempt to explain it because I <laughs> won't be able to do that, but the overall attitude that I got was that they are not willing to compromise on ergonomics for anything. Even something as silly as having these exposed seams here on the thumb cluster. And I think that's kind of a theme that you might notice throughout this video is that they really just are not willing to compromise on ergonomics for, for anything. Anyways, moving on, I love that the power buttons are actually buttons and not switches. I far prefer this to the switches on the Kinesis Advantage 360 Pro, which are these things right here. It's just so much easier to just hit that power button, turn it off and turn it back on. Anyways, let's talk about the typing experience and comfort of this keyboard. So I picked the Chalk V1 Linear Red Pros and they feel excellent. This is of course a personal preference, but out of the four types of switches that you can choose when ordering a Glove 80, these have the lightest actuation force of 35 GF. I think GF stands for gram force which is supposed to be great for RSI. I actually got these same switches for the Voyager. The black ones in here are the ones that came with the Voyager. And as you can see in there, those have the red pros in them. I still have a few extras, but I've been using them for about one to two months and I can concur my fingers feel much less fatigued after using these switches. And also these palm keycaps, they, they feel excellent. Not only does the material feel great, but they also have this curved profile and they really do help with kind of feeling your way around the keyboard. At first I was a little disappointed the keyboard didn't include homing keys, the ones with the little bump on F and J, but after typing on it for a short time, I'm actually totally fine that there aren't. It's not much of an issue for this keyboard, and I would say the Kinesis is similar in this regard, because placing your fingers on home row feels so good, but anywhere else feels super unnatural, which makes this keyboard self-homing. And the keyboard actually comes with some homing keys, which I'll just pull out right here. So so the regular keycaps have what's called an MCC profile, which is kind of this half pipe shape and is designed specifically for the Glove 80, but the keyboard actually came with two keycaps that have an MBK profile, which are meant to serve as homing keys. They have a dish profile. The difference is quite subtle, but like I said, even without these, you will know when you are not on home row. Anyways, let's move on to the key wells. The key wells, just like on the Kinesis, are super comfortable. I said I wouldn't be doing many comparisons, but this is one that I have to do. The Kinesis and the Glove 80 are the only two keyboards on the market with concave key wells, at least as far as I'm aware. When I first compared these two keyboards, I just sat my hand inside each of the key wells, and honestly, I felt like the Kinesis was more comfortable. However, then I did some typing tests on the Kinesis and compared it to the Glove 80, and the Glove 80 was noticeably more comfortable to type on, and that's saying a lot. My RSI did a complete 180 when I got the Advantage 360. It essentially disappeared overnight, and I mentioned that in my review video of the Advantage 360 Pro, just like how comfortable it is. So 
To say that the Glove 80 feels noticeably more comfortable to type on is saying a lot, and the Glove 80 accomplishes this in a few ways. First, Q and P and 1 and 0 are noticeably easier to reach compared to the Kinesis. Also, T, G, and B, and on the right side, Y, H, and N also require less movement. The bottom row also feels more natural to reach when compared to the Kinesis. I wouldn't have been able to point this out myself, but there was an article put out pretty recently by this guy named Daniel de Kolk. Sorry if I mispronounced that, I'm full-blooded American. But he points out that although your fingers are different lengths when held out like this, especially the pinky is gonna be quite a bit shorter than the rest of your fingers, as you curl your fingers, they're actually a lot more comparable in length. And this is something that the Glove 80 takes into account, leading to a more natural position for the fingers on the bottom row. And something I've noticed about my particular flavor of RSI is it's really just tons of small but uncomfortable movements that get my RSI to flare up. And by uncomfortable, the kind of discomfort that doesn't really even register in your brain. But as I type, I've noticed that I need to kind of keep my hands a little floaty so that when I hit, for example, a, a key on like the outer column out here, my whole hand moves as opposed to anchoring my palm on the palm rest and kind of doing a little stretch. This tiny extra little stretch has been the cause of so much pain for me. However, after typing all day my hands get tired and without even being aware of it I start anchoring my palm on the palm rest and they're just tired and they just want to rest there and and then I start getting that stretch rather than being a little more floaty I'm kind of exaggerating the motion here on the keyboard and also on the glove 80 it's kind of hard to show me doing this incorrectly but if we pull out the kinesis advantage 360 the Q right here is just a little further away just enough that like I kind of have to do that uncomfortable stretch. This is especially true like here trying to hit tab. This actually isn't <laughs> tab because I've totally remapped this keyboard, but hitting tab or like shift and control, they they take a, just this little bit of a stretch and it's, it really is small movements. But if anything I've learned in this journey is that small movements can have a huge impact on RSI and just overall comfort of typing. But if we come back here to the Glove 80, this Q is it's just so much easier to reach. And that's a good segue over to talking about the thumb cluster, where yet again, I think the Glove 80 really shines. When I was using the Kinesis as my daily driver, I primarily only utilized two of the thumb cluster keys, these two right here, with some occasional use out of this bottom key right here. But these three other keys were basically unused because they're just so hard to reach with the thumb and they required me to look down at the keyboard to make sure I was hitting the right key, which, you know, doesn't really work for touch typing. The Glove 80's thumb cluster just makes so much more sense. With that being said, the stretch is still too far to comfort hit the outer keys during regular typing, at least for me, especially this key right here. But an important thing to point out is that all six keys on the thumb cluster are easy to distinguish during touch typing, and I can utilize these outer keys for more infrequent use such as uh, like caps lock and caps word and also my magic layer which I have assigned to this key right here. One drawback on the thumb cluster has to do with these three closest keys right here to the rest of the keyboard. The temptation to utilize all three is just is too great but I've been finding it difficult to comfortably transition from this key right here on the top row to the two keys below it. The thumb is great at making these lateral or side to side movements but it's a lot more difficult to make these vertical or up and down movements. So even though these three keys are comfortable to reach, I found it somewhat awkward to transition between the top row and the bottom row, especially during fast typing. So every keyboard sits a little raised on the desk. How's this compared to other keyboards? If we look at a side profile, you can see that the bottom scoop right here is almost touching the desk. And if you do sit it down on the desk and kind of peek under there, you can see that there's just barely like maybe one millimeter of clearance between this part of the scoop and the actual desk surface. These keys here at the very bottom, D and K, are probably the same height as the Voyager right here. According to Mo Ergo's website, um, these keys are actually 20 millimeters above the desk on the Glove 80, but the Kinesis definitely sits higher. 
I've personally never really found this to be a problem though, like how high off the desk the keyboard sits. And I think it can easily be accommodated by like a standing desk or a different chair position. There's actually a lot of moving parts when it comes to ergonomics. And if we're being real here, the keyboard is only one piece of the puzzle. I've actually in recent months been forming the opinion that your choice of office chair actually plays a bigger role in keyboard ergonomics than most of us may realize. It doesn't seem very obvious at first, but it makes a ton of sense when you start to think about it. Now let's talk about the tenting. This to me was the most frustrating part of this keyboard's design. And I know saying that is going to irk the people <laughs> over at Moho Ergo, but I'm just saying I'm not a fan of the tenting mechanism, but they truly are not willing to make any sacrifices to ergonomics. Even though this keyboard is relatively new to the market, it was an eight year journey for Steven and Chris, the other co-creator of the Glove 80, and they went through over 500 ergonomic experiments and hardware prototypes and more than six years of testing. When I told Steven that I wasn't a huge fan of the tenting mechanism, he <laughs> seemed a little exasperated and explained they've built and tested just about every tenting system there is. But this was the only system that could satisfy all of their requirements for getting the best ultimate ergonomics. It seems simple and it is simple, but it results from years of testing and refinement. Plus conveniently, it doubles as a built-in mounting system. So this mechanism of unscrewing these legs allows for very precise fine-tuning of the tenting angle. With that being said, I would almost prefer the convenience of the step system on the Kinesis over the threaded M4 legs here on the Glove 80, but once again, the design philosophy on this keyboard is all about getting the best possible ergonomics. Something Steven and Chris have made clear is not something they're willing to compromise on, even if it means having a rather tedious mechanism for tenting. But can you guess what, ironically for this keyboard, is really horrible on my fingers, wrist, and especially elbow, is doing a lot of twisting motions to adjust these legs. The excessive amount of screwing can really make one question their life choices. Not a sentence I thought I'd ever be saying on this channel, but on a practical level, it's rather time consuming. I've spent more time than I'd like to admit finicking with these legs to find the most comfortable angle. However, even though there's 10 legs on total. This is a fixed leg right here, but there's one, two, three, four, five, so 10 in total. I've discovered that I can get away with only adjusting these two legs on each side. This one right here would add a little more stability, but um, I found that I can just kind of ignore it. Not sure, that's not official Glove 80 advice, so. <laughs> Um, yeah, moving on. Another thing that I wasn't too impressed with is that the legs have a little bit of wobble to them. And this gets more pronounced the further the legs stick out from the studs. <laughs> Obviously, it'll wobble a lot if you completely take it out, but that has a decent amount of wobble. However, the keyboard does come with some extra O-rings and nuts specifically for this problem. So let's see if I just take out this leg right here, grab a nut and their user guide goes through this, although to be honest, it was giving me a headache to uh, read over that. So I'm sorry, Steven. I, I'm, I'm not sure if uh, I even understood it correctly. Oh man, okay. I swear I'm not an idiot most of the time. But if you put on one of these uh, M4 nuts right here, I think in the user guide, it doesn't actually say you have to put on an O-ring when you have the legs extended really far out, but I'm gonna put it on there because it just, it feels right. Okay, so screw that on there a little bit and then just tighten down the nut. And then it comes with this little spanner right here that we can use to crank that down. And once you do that, there, there's no wobble in there. So it feels very secure. All right, so let's talk about the battery. I haven't had this keyboard long enough to test this out myself, but according to Mo Ergo's website, the battery should last two to four weeks on the left half and two months or more on the right half. From my observations, as long as I didn't have the RGB effects turned on, the battery indicator lights barely moved, which if you hit the, the magic layer, then that shows these battery light indicators. So I'll just turn off one of the lights right here so that you can see this a little better, but but when you hit the magic key, which on the default layout, the magic key is actually right here. I move mine to right here, and if you hit that, then it shows you these battery indicator lights. So the number of LEDs across each row indicates the charge level. In this case, I only have two of these LEDs turned on, so that means that both halves of the keyboard are between 20 and 39% fully charged. I don't know why I said fully charged, but six means that it's 100% charged or it's charging. And I can 
verify that by we'll just plug it in real quick and it does take a second for it to show up so we'll just sit here and wait well i will sit here and wait all right so that took a second but now you can see this is saying that this half of the keyboard is plugged in and charging while this half is still in that 20 to 39 percent battery range and that's kind of weird those turn red i'm not entirely sure why but this demonstrates that when the rgb effects are turned on the battery drains very quickly i'm not sure when i started recording and working on this video i've been sitting down here for i want to say like three hours wow has it been that long yeah i really suck at this but uh yeah so about three hours and when i started oh look it just went down even further but when i started recording these had been charging overnight and had a, a full charge and you can see that the battery life has already drained quite significantly in an earlier test that i did which was not at all scientific it only took about five hours to drain the battery to the point that the rgb lights automatically shut off i didn't catch the exact timing because i wasn't sitting here at my desk when the rgb lights turned off but this actually highlights kind of a nice feature of this keyboard. When the battery gets to 20% charge, the RGB lights will automatically dim to half brightness and they will completely disable at 10% battery, which is an awesome preventative measure to stop you from accidentally draining your battery completely and leaving you without a functioning keyboard if for some reason you can't charge it immediately. So if you want RGB effects on, then plan on keeping this keyboard plugged in because even though I didn't get the exact amount of time it took for the RGB lights to turn off, it was not long enough to last a full eight hour workday. And you know, like it might be possible if let's say, I think uh, red takes the least amount of energy, we'll call that red right there. So if you turn the brightness all the way down, so that is just barely lit up at all, then you might be able to last an entire workday, but I don't know. I don't want to deal with that kind of stress. I have enough stressful things in my life I got to deal with. Uh, but if you do plan on keeping it plugged in, then plan on either taking up two USB ports or pick up one of these split cables on Mo Ergo's website. The one on Mo Ergo's website has a built-in USB hub, which allows for simultaneous charging and data connection of both halves of the keyboard. I searched on Amazon for something like this so I can, you know, milk that juicy affiliate affiliate link money. I'm just kidding. I, I actually haven't earned a dime of <laughs> affiliate money from Amazon yet, but apparently that specific type of split USB-C cable with the built-in USB hub is really hard to come by. Now let's talk about programming and firmware. Okay, so configuration is not as bad as it was on the Kinesis Advantage 360 Pro, but it's still very lacking in quality of life features. And also it doesn't have dark mode. <laughs> When it comes to ease of use, I thought the layout editor on Moergo's website was only marginally better than the one used for the Kinesis Advantage 360. However, if you turn a blind eye to the user experience, then this layout editor in many respects is the most advanced out of both Kinesis and Oryx. I've been assured they're working on making their layout editor more user-friendly for beginners, but in its current form, it definitely caters to power users. But some features I want to highlight are, uh, first, low Cal. So this doesn't really impact those based in the US, such as myself, but this is a, a huge win for the international audience. Next is custom defined behaviors right inside the browser. Take note, Kinesis. This was a source of frustration for me on the Advantage 360 Pro, which lacks the smart set program key on the Advantage 360 non-pro and the Advantage 2, and it quickly forced me into forking their config repo on GitHub and having to forego the layout editor entirely. But in this editor, you can plop custom behaviors right in the browser. However, it would be great to have syntax highlighting and formatting. The best feature, in my opinion, is the ability to download your firmware at the click of a button. This this isn't quite as nice as Oryx, which removes the step of dragging and dropping firmware files onto your keyboard, but it gets it a step closer. During my keyboard journey over the last few years, I've decided that the quality of the software used to program a keyboard has an outsized impact on the overall experience. I'm not saying this is the case for everyone, that has just been my experience. This is an area that ZSA has a leg up on Moergo and Kinesis. The Oryx configuration software you use to program ZSA's keyboards really sets them apart from the competition. So even though Moergo's layout editor is better than 
and kinesis's, I still found myself almost immediately searching for alternatives. Although in this case, it wasn't due to technical limitations like it was on the Kinesis Advantage 360 Pro, but rather due to it lacking in quality of life features I've become so accustomed to with Oryx. I found this piece of software, which is far more user-friendly and compatible with ZMK-based keyboards, including the Glove 80. Honestly, I think I would have switched to this layout editor for the dark mode alone. If there's enough interest, maybe I'll make a video showing how to set this up. Let me know in the comments. I know a lot of people are into manually programming their keyboards with the underlying ZMK or QMK firmware, but I would also bet for every one person who prefers manually editing their key map file, there's at least a hundred more who simply could not care less. Even though I personally have the skills to be a power user, I don't want to be a power user. And I know I'm being tough on Moergo and Kinesis here, so to be fair, Moergo's layout editor is only about six months old, and they have been making pretty rapid progress on it. So moving on, the RGB lighting, as you can see, it's there, it exists, but it felt kind of disappointing. It's one of those features I find useful for highlighting specific keys, kind of like the magic layer here, and also for providing visual feedback about which layer I'm currently on. But per layer RGB lighting isn't currently supported by ZMK. So for RGB lighting, I was hoping for easy configuration out of the box, but it looks like this feature is going to be held up until it's added to ZMK. Now, as far as Bluetooth goes, it just works, and it's so refreshing after the Advantage 360 Pro. Occasionally, the right-hand side will lose connection with the left, but that only happens after flashing the firmware, and it always reconnects immediately after turning it off and then on again. All right, let's talk about portability. So I already mentioned that it comes with this travel case, and this is a great addition to have, although I'll admit the case is pretty big. So it does fit in my backpack along with my 16-inch uh, MacBook Pro, but it's a squeeze and it really does not leave room for much else. And these just fit in here just like this. One half goes in upside down and then the other half just goes in like that. And yeah, it fits in there really good. It is a hard case, not a soft case like the Voyager and the Moonlander have but I mostly work from home and I only occasionally go into the office. But when I do, I'll probably take the Voyager because it is so compact for traveling. And honestly, the Voyager has been an absolute delight to type on. I never thought I would describe typing on a keyboard as being delightful, but I also got called the keyboard guy at work the last time that I went into the office, which I also never thought would happen. And I can only imagine the comments I'd get if I mounted the Glove 80 to my chair while in the office. Uh, it's a great conversation starter, which for some of us neurodivergent individuals, really not a good thing. So speaking of mounting, this was not a feature that I thought I would care about, but I was actually way more excited about this feature than I thought I would be. I do feel like the system has a a few shortcomings, but mounted has actually become my preferred setup for this keyboard, and I was an absolute skeptic about this feature. I've watched Ben Valak's videos and thought, like, that just looks overkill, like who actually does that? Then recently there was that video from Code to the Moon where he says, the chair mount is definitely one of those things that you didn't realize you need until you try it. And I was genuinely thinking like this guy has got to be simping. And then I drank the Kool-Aid and yeah, I'm converted. And I absolutely did not see that coming. The mounting plates in the truest sense come as a kit where it's not a full end-to-end -end mounting solution and you still need to source some of your own parts. A big down side is that the kit is fairly expensive at 120 US dollars for the quick release system. Then I spent about 60 additional US dollars on more hardware. You could potentially save quite a bit of money by making your own plates like the ones that I have right here. I just picked up a piece of quarter inch birch plywood for 10 bucks from my local hardwood store. And I also own a router. So I was able to use the acrylic plate right here as a template and get these perfectly straight lines using a router bit. The plywood is thicker than the acrylic plates. So once again, using my router, I removed some material right here where the quick release plate goes and that made it thin enough for the bolts to go all the way through. So moving on, I ended up getting these small rig articulating arms.
arms, which lock into place when you tighten them down. So if I just crank that down, then like this is very tight. I was worried they wouldn't be able to bear the weight of my hand while resting on the keyboard, but it's surprisingly very rigid once you lock it down. Also tried these clamps out right here, which work good for attaching to thin spots like on my chair right here. This is the Herman Miller Embody gaming chair, but it really struggled to hold on to thicker mounting points such as here on my armchairs and here on the edge of my desk. So these weren't really working out for me and instead I ended up getting these C clamps right here. And this is future me here discovering that my audio cut out at this point in the video. But the overall gist was if you want to mount your keyboard onto your desk, then I suggest getting some of these C clamps. Admittedly, their build quality is pretty crappy, but for the price, it's not a bad deal. However, they don't have as much reach as the other clamps. So I had a hard time getting them to work on my chair, but really your mounting options are determined by your setup, such as what chair and what desk you have. To wrap things up, you will not find a more ergonomic keyboard than the Glove 80 currently on the market. The learning curve for these keyboards is always going to be really difficult, but this keyboard heavily caters to power users. In talking to MoErgo, they're aware of this and making strides to improve the onboarding process and learning materials for those who are new to the Glove 80. In general, there's a lot of nuances that you don't expect when using this keyboard, all of which is covered in their 56 page user guide. So if you get this keyboard, then I hope you enjoy some light reading. The tripod mounting kit is a very intriguing feature that I didn't think I would be excited about, but I've liked it so much that I'm seriously considering ordering the mounting kit for the Voyager. Although do be aware that the mounting kit is just a kit and you're still going to be responsible for sourcing your own parts and doing a little extra work. The layout editor exposes advanced features, but it still lacks many quality of life features that I've become accustomed to with Oryx's layout editor, but it's only been around for six months compared to Oryx's, which has been around for more like eight years. So this is something to keep an eye on in the future. Overall, the Glove 80 is an excellent keyboard, despite some flaws. And if I were Kinesis, I'd be feeling pretty nervous by now. And that is it for this lengthy video. Make sure to subscribe so you get notified about my next video when it comes out, which will be about something I don't know. I haven't decided yet, but this channel is exclusively focused on software engineering. So most likely it'll be on keyboards.